Welcome to Hebrew Readers Church. I'm your brother Kasafo, here with your brother Zakwa. And hope you all enjoying the Sabbath day, enjoying the series of edification for our growth within. And may I have continue to prosper us all. Today we're going to be discussing forgiveness, an important topic for helping us grow. We have been given a command of our Lord. And hopefully we can get insight on it today. Zachary, can you read Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, please? Sure. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Now, what makes the Father perfect? Can you read Psalms 86 and 5, please? For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive, and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. He is perfect because he's good, ready to forgive, and plenteous in mercy to all that call upon him. So how can we be perfect like him? Luke chapter 6, verse 36, please. Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. So we are to be ready to forgive and merciful to those who we have an opportunity to be merciful unto in order to be perfect as our Father. Allah Hayyam doesn't grow bitter or hold grudges in his compassion. Can you read Hermas, Mandate 9, chapter 1, verse 3, please? But Allah Hayyam is not as men who bear grudge, but himself is without malice and have compassion on his creatures. So we can come out of the carnal perspective if we also have no malice to bear grudges by having compassion. Now, what if Allah Hayyam sees the person won't stop what they're doing to their own hurt and will continue in it until they reach an evil end? What does he do? Can you read Ecclesiasticus, which is the book of Sirach, chapter 18, verse 12, please? He saw and perceived their end to be evil. Therefore, he multiplied his compassion. So we ought to have compassion, letting go of malice to bear grudge for wrongdoings done. And if we perceive a person is headed for evil end, multiply compassion for them instead of growing bitter about what they're doing or looking down upon them because they're still being held in a bad habit out of compassion. This will make us perfect in mercy like the Father. Can you read Wisdom of Solomon chapter 11 verse 23, please? Sure. But thou hast mercy upon all. For thou canst do all things, and winkest at the sins of men, because they should amend. He winks at sins because we should amend our ways, and he multiplies his compassion when he sees we are headed for evil end. And he is ready to forgive, plenteous in mercy to anyone that turns in repentance to call upon him to help understand how he has no malice to be bitter or bear grudge. There is a reward if we operate in compassion and mercy like this. Can you read Matthew 6, verse 14 and 15, please? Sure. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. That's straightforward about the benefit of having compassion and mercy. Continue, please. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So our forgiveness. For our faults hinges upon the forgiveness we have for others. Can you read Sirach chapter 28, verse 2, please? Forgive thy neighbor the hurt that he have done unto thee. So shall thy sins also be forgiven when thou prayest. Okay, I have to forgive. But is there a set limit to how often we should forgive when someone hurts us? Can you read Matthew chapter 18, verse 21 and 22, please? Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how often, Lord, how oft shall <laughs> my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? Yahweh saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Forgive from the heart, regardless of how often we are done wrong to be perfect as the Father. You might as well touch on Matthew 18 and 22 real quick before you go on. Oh, no. Go ahead. 
Um, it's interesting because Yadche says, how often shall you forgive them? And you can see that Yadche had no stipulation in his forgiveness. There was no, okay, if they repent, then you forgive them 70 times seven, or if they, whatever the case is, it's, it's for you. The forgiveness is for you. That's why I said you forgive them 70 times seven, because no matter what they did and no matter how many times they done it, it's so that you don't bear grudge. It's so that malice is not in your heart. And that's why you have to forgive them no matter whether or not they say sorry or whether or not they come and repent about it or whatever the case is, because it's, it's going to affect you and your walk. And that's what we're working on. And if you're here, I know that that's what you're working on because you want to not bear that grudge or that malice so that you can actually walk forth from the fruit of the spirit. So praise the Lord for that understanding. And as exactly what you're speaking of, it's for you. It's also for us to forgive ourselves as well. The same way we are to be forgiven and merciful and compassionate unto a brother in love, that's the same way we are to forgive ourselves. Can you read Matthew chapter 22, verse 39, please? And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So mercy and compassion to forgive has to be for ourselves as well to love ourselves and love our neighbors. If we can't forgive ourselves for our faults, we can't forgive others in truth. As Zachwell mentioned before, how we treat ourselves is how we treat everyone else. Can you read Sirach chapter 14, verse 5, please? He that is evil to himself, to whom will he be good? He shall not take pleasure in his goods. So we can't truly be good to another without being good to ourselves as well. If we won't forgive ourselves for the mistakes we have made, that sorrow will keep us from moving forward and growth. Can you read Sirach chapter 30, verse 23, please? Love thy own soul and comfort thy heart. Remove sorrow far from thee, for sorrow hath killed many, and there is no profit therein. Allah wants us to love our soul too and remove sorrow because it keeps us from him because his spirit dwells in cheerfulness, which prolongs our life. Can you read Sirach chapter 30, verse 22, please? Hey, Kasa, I'm sorry, man. I'm going to stop you one more time if you don't mind. I'm, I wasn't prepared for it. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. In Sirach 30 and 23, it says, love thy own soul, right? Then it also says, and comfort thy heart. It didn't say wait on comfort. It said for you to comfort your own heart. Like you have to actually speak good words to yourself and comfort yourself. You can't sit there and beat yourself down. You actually have to change the way that you treat yourself mentally and emotionally. That's the accountability that we have. We have to do our part. All right. You can't be looking for comfort outside of yourself and wondering why it's never coming when you're not able to comfort yourself in your wrong or whatever the case is or when someone wronged you. If you're not able to, to deal with that and come to a good place, then it's hard for you to be at a good place with anyone else. Yeah. In light of this, I want to touch on this sorrow while we're here so we can build on this. Can you read Hermas, Mandate 10, chapter 1, verse 1, chapter 2, verse 5 and 6, and then chapter 3, verse 1 to 3, please? All right. The Shepherd of Hermes, Mandate 10, chapter 1, verse 1.
Put away sorrow from thyself, saith he, for she is the sister of doubtful mindedness and of angry temper. Chapter 2, verse 5. Put away therefore from thyself sadness and afflict not the Holy Spirit that dwelleth in thee. Least happily she intercede with Allah against thee and depart from thee. So that having to comfort our own heart, that's a work we have to put in to keep the Holy Spirit with us. We don't want to lose her. So we have to speak truth against the evil that sorrow is bringing because sorrow wants us to come back to doubtful mindedness and angry temper. Okay, continue, please. For the spirit of Allah that was given unto this flesh endureth not sadness, neither constraint. And that's important because there's a scripture in Sirach that says, don't be ashamed to confess your sins and force not the course of the river. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit doesn't, dwell with sorrow neither constraint so she doesn't like to be withheld so that's why david when he was wrong he said i sinned he didn't withhold her from moving forward you want to flow as water with allah you get shown a fault you roll with it all right thank you let me continue on speak those good words and don't let sorrow hold you back or hold us back continue please uh, if somebody makes a mistake, they made a mistake. Forgive them. It was a mistake. Keep going forward. Don't hold on to it. Like, yeah. Makes you understand why she's the living water. <laughs> she flows. Right. She continues moving throughout all creation. Uh, chapter 3, verse 1. Therefore, clothe thyself in cheerfulness, which have favor with Allah always. And it's acceptable to him and rejoice in it. For every cheerful man worketh good and thinketh good and despise of sadness. Amen. The Holy Spirit's in there. Allah winks at ignorance, knowing the sons of men should amend. Allah doesn't lose chair, doesn't lose hope, because charity hopeth all things, beareth all things, endureth all things. That's staying in chair, not being grieved. Because it's an optimistic mind, faithful, right. just in Allah Hayyam. Continue, please. But the sad man is always committing sin. In the first place, he committed sin because he grieveth the Holy Spirit, which was given to a man being a cheerful spirit. And in the second place, by grieving the Holy Spirit, he doeth lawlessness, and that he doeth not intercede with neither confess unto Allah For the intercession of a sad man hath never at any time power to ascend to the altar of Allah Wherefore say I, do if not the intercession of him that is saddened ascend to the altar, because, saith he, sadness is seated at his heart. Thus sadness mingled with the intercession doeth not suffer the intercession to ascend pure to the altar. Sadness is an evil spirit. We can't have evil inclinations in us for our prayers to ascend. So this helps us understand how these spirits are working against us to keep us from moving forward. Remember, it was in the first place we erred in because we grieved the Holy Spirit. We got out of chair instead of being thankful that something got revealed. All right. That's the childlike mind. We should be to the place where we know we have stuff we need to change. We know we're not perfect. We know we need help. So in that mind, everything that comes, it's a blessing. All right. And there's a, there's a scripture, I'm going to butcher it a bit. It talks about um, if you if you will... You will be, if you will for something, if you want it, oh, it's Sirach chapter 15. You will be helped. Yeah. Whatever him like, he set before man life and death. And whatever him liketh will be given him. The other thoughts about we'll be given help for something we desire. So that help comes in correction, in revealing of faults. 
So it's all positive for us. Like, hey, you show me something, I can go nowhere but up from here. <laughs> Another thing right. got revealed. I got more insight now. So that change of perspective will help keep the Holy Spirit there instead of giving place to sorrow and doubtful mind and anger. Well, it's, it's going to further on in the lesson, you're going to actually get to the place that actually really touches on that as what really helps you overcome that it's actually having a good desire because it's actually the good desire that actually makes you push forward trying to do the things that are right and pleasing and not getting caught up in sorrow because something comes forth because a lot of times the thing that comes forth is something that you already know you just don't want to you don't want to hear it from maybe the person or you don't want to deal with it truly and that desire of not really wanting to actually put forth the effort to overcome it makes you go into sorrow. And we're going to get on that right after this so that we'll we touch it while it's hot, so to speak. All right. Uh, <laughs> we see how sorrow keeps us from moving forward. Let's finish this Hermas, please. In chapter three, verse four. All right. Therefore, cleanse thyself from this wicked sadness. And thou shalt live unto Allah. Yea, and all they shall live unto Allah, who shall cast away sadness from themselves and clothe themselves in all cheerfulness. Amen. Yet again, we'll be instructed to do something. We were told to comfort our hearts earlier. Now we're being told to cleanse ourselves from this sadness. Mm -hmm. This takes, we have to speak the truth to ourselves, speak good things, speak against the unrighteous thoughts. Pray on to Allah for deliverance from these thoughts. It's a work we have to put in. All right. Get into cheerfulness. And for insight and understanding why it's important to be cheerful is because know who's helping you by revealing the fault. <laughs> Can you read right. Acts chapter 3, verse 26, please? Unto you first, Allah, having raised up his son, Yache sent him to bless you and turning away every one of you from his iniquities. That's Yache in you. Them faults getting revealed, that's the blessing. Known as Yache, that's giving us the blessing of revealing our faults because he wants us to be cleansed. Confession gives us forgiveness and he is faithful to cleanse us from all unrighteousness by continuing to show us our faults so that we can get to perfection. Can you read 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, please? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is how a good man operates, and we have precepts to confirm it. You definitely shouldn't overlook that confessing your sins because being able to, in the first place, a lot of times how sorrow plays on you, it's because you don't want to be wrong. And confessing your sins actually takes that, that weight off of you, and actually you're actually speaking truth in your heart, and that delivers you from all the other evil spirits. So I, I wouldn't take confessing your sins lightly at all. Um, really being honest and being like, okay, I did wrong in that. And really confessing it and speaking truth so that it doesn't give place for the other evil spirits to come and afflict you, especially as we're talking about forgiveness. Um, being able to speak truth in your heart and confess your faults is part of forgiving because you're putting yourself in the hands of Allah instead of your own. Mandate three, chapter one, verse one. And again, he said to me, love truth and let nothing but truth proceed out of thy mouth, that the spirit which Allah made to dwell in this flesh may be found true in the sight of all men. And thus shall the Lord who dwelleth in thee be glorified. For the Lord is true in every word and with him there is no falsehood so that confession of speaking truth glorifies the lord and the spirit of Allah will be found true so it's definitely essential and it's a great work in the faith
First Clement chapter 51, verse 3, please. The scripture you just said, First Clement actually goes into it too. Okay. Um, first Clement chapter 51, verse 3. For it is good for a man to make confession of his trespasses rather than to harden his heart. As the heart of those who was hardened, who made sedition against Moses, the servant of Elohim, whose condemnation was clearly manifest. Look at that. It's a hardness of our heart not to confess our sins. All right. We have clear insight to see the dichotomy. We can glorify the Lord and keep the spirit pleased with us by telling the truth and confessing, committing ourselves unto Allah Hayyam, or we can give in to the works of the devil and harden our hearts. All right. Let's stay where we are. Because the whole thing that we were talking about is how not forgiving and sorrow, how it keeps you from growing or going forward and having to be like, like you said earlier, having to be like the Holy Spirit that is like, is flowing like water. By not confessing our faults and speaking truth in our heart, we actually are stopping the process of actually moving forward and actually growing. Because we're hardening our hearts in pride, looking at everyone else instead of looking at ourselves. Amen. Thank you. Can you read first comment 52 and 1, please? The master, brethren, hath need of nothing at all. He desireth not anything of any man save to confess unto him. Yeah, look at that. <laughs> when you're wondering what does the lord want from me <laughs> what does the master need from me confession all right glorify him and confess he is Allah I am. verse two please for the elect david saith, i will confess unto the lord and it shall please him more than a young calf that grow of horns and hoofs let the poor see it and rejoice. Amen. See that. Have that insight and see it for what it is. Now we can rejoice. Right. We know right. exactly what he needs. That's right. He just simplified our life. <laughs> <laughs> Confess. Glorify right. him. Show the spirit to be true. And it's going to please him more than all those animal sacrifices. And you know, the animal sacrifices are repentance, you know, it's usually because if you did something wrong, you will bring forth an animal or whatever the case is. So like just confessing unto him, like it's bringing forth repentance. Yeah. Bringing forth humility. Knowing all this. Can you read Colossians chapter four, verse two, please? Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. So keep sorrow from us so that our prayer can continue and ascend to the throne of Allah I am pure. And watch, be on God, cheerfully looking for more growth, looking for more blessings of faults being revealed. And every time he shows it, have thanksgiving. Right. Stay cheerful and give thanks and confess because you know you're glorifying Allah by doing so. Right. Amen. Now, touching on coming out of that sorrow because we see how the sorrow of the world can lead us astray. But the holy sorrow saves us. Can we read Second Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9 through 11. All right. Second Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. For ye were made sorry after Allah manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. So there is an Allah sorrow. 
and he's going to explain what this Allah Hayamli sorrow is. Continue, please. But Allah Hayamli sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. This is important insight for us. We need to know the difference because we want the one that gets us unto salvation. Continue, please. For behold, the self same thing. That ye sorrowed after Allahimly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge. In all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. We have to dig into this because we want to learn how to clear ourselves from our faults by this Allah Hayamli sorrow. If you can go back from the top, please. What carefulness it wrought in you? The word carefulness is G4710. It means speed. That is by implication, despatch, eagerness, earnestness. So that speed to get it right, and that eagerness, like, I really want to get this right. It was sincere and attentive. Diligence, as one of the definition is. All right, continue, please. What clearing of yourselves? Clearing is G627. And it means a plea, an apology, answer for self, clearing of self-defense. So when we become more diligent, and we're eager and earnest to get it right, that clears us. That's an apology by our actions. That defends us against the wrong we committed. Continue, please. What indignation? Indignation is G24. Indignation, irritation, vexation. Now, what happens in the process as we're earnestly working for change, we're going to start to notice how that evil spirit's causing us to go astray. Because we want to see it now. We really want to get it right. We're going to develop indignation and irritation against that evil spirit because we're not going to have pleasure in the evil that it was getting us to do anymore. Now we're upset with that spirit. Like we know it's this spirit in me that's doing this to me. That frustration comes at it because we're on Allah Hayim's side. We lose that pleasure in iniquity because we're developing the hatred for evil. Continue, please. What fear? Fear is G5401. That's to be put in fear. Alarm or fright. Be afraid. As you could imagine, we have the eagerness to get this right. We're diligent. We're paying attention. Yet, just like Paul we're doing the things that we don't want to do. This is the reality check where we see that these evil spirits are taking advantage of us. We're being overtaken and we're confessing our sins. It helps understand how powerful Allah Hayyam truly is and how much we actually need his help. This helps develop fear for him because when you see you can't actually do it by yourself, it makes you understand it can't be done without Allah Hayyam, and it develops that true reverence for him to know it's only by him this deliverance can come and knowing and seeing his mercy as we're making mistakes going along and he still has compassion on us giving us an opportunity we develop that reverence for him and that fright knowing that if it's not for his compassion, we wouldn't be here. Continue, please. What vehement desire? Vehement desire, G1972. A longing for. We get to a place where we have that true fear for him, understanding it's only because of him and only by him that we're being strengthened to move forward. Our desire grows, that love 
fear and love for Allah grows to where we're truly desiring to attain. Our heart is becoming wholehearted toward him to do right. Continue, please. What zeal? Zeal is excitement of mind, ardor, and passion of enthusiasm, fervor of spirit. That's G2205. As you can see, that wholeheartedness comes into us, that vehement desire. Our excitement, our passion really goes towards the right thing, towards his fruit. This is the experience of that change that we're going through and going to continue going through until we get to the perfect place that he wants us to be. Continue, please. What revenge? Revenge is G1557, vindication, retribution. When we get to where our desire is wholeheartedly to do what's right, and that's where our passion truly lies, and our fear for Allah is great in that we would fear him and not do evil, understanding that it's him that's keeping us and bringing us through everything, and we have that hatred and indignation towards the evil spirits that work against us, and we're diligent and careful to ensure we do what's right, that's going to vindicate us before our Allah So that's the process we have to go through. That's the Allah sorrow we need to move forward from the spirit of the sorrow of the world. Hopefully that's helpful for us to have insight on it. Picking back up, can you read Sarah chapter 30, verse 22, please? The gladness of the heart is the life of a man, and the joyfulness of a man prolongeth his days. That's why that cheerfulness was so important, because the spirit dwells in it, and Allah dwells in it, and it prolongs our life. Continue to verse 21, please. Uh, Sirach chapter 30, verse 21. Give not over thy mind to heaviness, and afflict not thyself in thy own counsel. Hopefully you understand how important that is now, because that heaviness is sorrow, the sister of double mind and angry temper. And it's not our place to afflict ourselves in our own counsel. Because we're not Allah Hayyam. So forgiving ourselves and being cheerful when showing our faults and thankful for the opportunity to make changes can deliver us from sorrow in not forgiving ourselves by judging ourselves in our own counsel. Let's actually love ourselves and others by not judging ourselves anymore or others like a true believer does. Can you read 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3, please? So in other words... When you do something wrong, you confess your fault, you repent unto Allah and you wait on Allah judgment, whatever that is. And to Allah whatever you're going to do to teach me a lesson, I receive it and go on moving forward. Can you read Psalms chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, please? <laughs> What do you want, Psalms? Psalms of Solomon, chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. The righteous stumbleth and holdeth a higher righteous. He falleth and looketh out for what Allah would do to him. He seeketh out whence his deliverance will come. That's what you were just explaining. Mm -hmm. Commit yourself unto Allah and you understand who he is. He's pitiful, plenteous in mercy. So you're looking out for how he would deliver you keeping your thoughts set upon him. That's the righteous way to forgive oneself and look out for what Allah Hayyam, the compassionate and merciful judge, would do. Mikasa, I got another yes. one. Yes. All right. You know, um, when I just said um, you wait on the the punishment or whatever Allah is going to do to teach you a lesson in whatever wrong you have done after you repent about it, um, Psalms 3 and 6 says, he seeketh 
out once his deliverance will come. So after you've committed yourself unto Allah and whatever punishment, it's acceptable for the thing that you've done wrong. It says you're actually supposed to seek when your deliverance is going to come. So you actually have to seek, okay, Allah now help me be delivered from whatever it is. Show me how I can be delivered from it. You actually have to seek it. So it's part of that um, when you were just going over the definitions, when it was talking about vehement desire, like all these different things that actually play into you seeking that deliverance from Allah actually seeking how he's going to deliver you and what insight he's going to give you to actually help you to get past wherever you are at that present moment of your walk. Allah is judge of all, so it's not for us to judge ourselves by not forgiving ourselves. Can you read 1 Corinthians 2 and 15, please? But he that is spiritual judges for all things, yet he himself is just of no man. So it's important not to judge others by not forgiving them, nor to judge ourselves by holding grudges and not forgiving ourselves as well. Because bearing a grudge is evil and works death in us because we can't move forward from whatever we can't let go in order to be plenteous in mercy like our Father. Can you read Shepherd of Hermas, Parable 9, Chapter 23, Verse 4, please? If Allah Haim and our Lord, who ruleth over all things and hath the authority over all his creation, beareth no grudge against them that confess their sins, but is propitiated, Doeth man, who is mortal and full of sins, bear a grudge against man as though he were able to destroy or save him? Uh, did you notice bearing a grudge about an offense committed against us is as if we think we are as Allah to be able to destroy or save someone? This shows holding grudges is a prideful thing to act as Allah as if we can take judgment into our own hands. So even not forgiving oneself after confession is taking judgment into one's own hands and acting as Allah to ourselves. Continue, please. I say unto you, I, the angel of repentance, unto as many as hold this heresy, put it away from you and repent. And the Lord shall heal your former sins. Amen. Amen. So we have to repent for being grudgeful and let go of the grudges in order to be healed from our former sins. Hence, it's important to forgive ourselves and others in order to move forward and be healed from our faults. Grudging is a demon that when we serve him, he eventually gets us put to death. Can you read Hermes Parable 9, the rest of verse 23 and 5, please? If you shall purify yourself from this demon, but if not, you shall be delivered unto him to be put to death. This demon of grudging gets us put to death because he causes us to break the law. Can you read Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, please? Thou shalt not avenge, nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am Ahiah. The word avenge is H5358, to grudge, that is avenge or punish. So there we see it's a grudge. And then grudge in the Hebrew is H5201, it's to guard figuratively to cherish anger so we're actually sinning if we are bearing any grudge or bitter with someone by holding on to or guarding that anger because it's not the spirit of love in this inclination rather it's the works of hatred one of the evil women clad in black and she keeps us from forgiveness for our sins as well can you read Sirach chapter 28 verse 3 through seven, please. Okay. 
So Rock chapter 28, verse 3. One man beareth hatred against another, and doeth he seek pardon from Ahia? He showeth no mercy to a man, which is like himself. And do if he ask forgiveness for his own sins? If he that is but flesh nourish hatred, who will entreat for pardon of his sins? Hold on, Zach. You remember that sorrow being seated at his heart doesn't cause his prayers to ascend pure to the altar? Right. Look also here. If hatred, that evil woman, is being nourished, our prayers can't be entreated for also. Mm. You can see how these evil spirits have an effect on keeping us from moving forward because we need to pray to be pardoned and cleansed from our sins. We right. need to pray to glorify our Lord Yache in confession. So hopefully we've seen what these spirits are doing to us so that we can be encouraged to stand away from them. Continue, please. So Rock 28 and 6. Remember thy end and let enmity cease. Remember corruption and death and abide in the commandments. If we humble ourselves and remember humbling thoughts that we are corruptible and death awaits from grudging, we can be long suffering and understanding to abide in the commandments, not bearing grudges or being bitter through the spirit of hatred. Can you read Sarat 28 and 7, please? Remember the commandments and bear no malice to thy neighbor. Who would have known holding something against someone is considered being malicious in the sight of Allah? Hopefully we understand the malice we can have for ourselves when we can't forgive ourselves either. Continue, please. Remember the covenant of the highest and wink at ignorance. The covenant and instructions of the law not to avenge or bear grudge helps us to be merciful and forgiven as we wink at ignorance as lovers of souls like Allah. Let's outgrow hatred unto perfection with this understanding to be perfect like our father. Can you read Sirach chapter 10 verse 6 and 7 please? Bear not hatred to thy neighbor for every wrong. And do nothing at all by injurious practices. Pride is hateful before Allah and man, man, and by both do one commit iniquity. So, this is important to see. We know now don't bear hatred for every wrong. We have to be long suffering. And we also see not to let hatred act in us to do something out of spite onto someone. What was I thought was very helpful was to see where does hatred get this power from to work in us? Pride. Pride sets her up to be able to enter in. All right. When that hatred comes in, you usually see when somebody starts acting out of their normal character. And that's when the injurious practices comes in, whether it be by word or whether it be by deed. And then that's when, you know, pride is in the midst because pride is the beginning of when one departed from Allah. And usually the injurious practices are away from Allah. So you can see where pride comes in and you commit iniquity. Pride inclines us onto the spirit of hatred, the culprit of not being willing to forgive from the heart. So we can have insight as to what spirits are working against us in this struggle to forgive. We need the spirit of love in our inclinations to be delivered. Let's get insight on hatred to overcome unforgiveness. Testament of God, chapter six, verse one, verse three and four, and verse six and seven, please. All right, Testament of God, chapter six, verse one. And now, my children, I exhort you, love ye each one his brother, and put away hatred from your hearts. Love one another in deed, and in word, and in the inclination of the soul. Notice God, he wants us to take accountability as well, to put away hatred from our hearts. 
we have to speak those words of truth. We have to stand against it. And then let our love be complete. Not just in word and not doing a good deed, though our heart may be somewhere else. But let it be whole in word, deed, and inclination of soul. We can't be fake with it. It has to be sincere for hatred to be put out of us. All right. Continue, please. Uh, Testament of God, chapter 6, verse 3. Love ye, therefore, one another from the heart. And if a man sin against thee, cast forth the poison of hate and speak peaceably to him. And in thy soul hold not guile. So hatred's poison starts with how we react to being wronged in our soul. If we are offended in our heart, instead of winking at ignorance like we're commanded, hatred's poison is in us. Some folks are stronger to do evil and can speak peacefully in guile, though in their heart they're angry, while others show forth the works of hatred in them by railing on or scolding the person who did them wrong. We have to be perfect by not holding bitterness or offense in our hearts and speak peaceably to the person who did us wrong sincerely. Notice, this is all before they even apologize or not. Because we have our trials within ourselves, regardless of what others may do. Continue, please. And if he confessed and repent, forgive him. Do we only forgive if the person confesses and repents? Continue, please. But if he deny it, do not get into a passion with him. At least catching the poison from thee, he take the swearing, and so thou sin doubly. So if you bring up something a person did wrong to you, and they deny it, let it go right there. Because that's the poison of hatred that leads us to continue trying to get them to admit they are wrong which will cause the poison of hatred to enter into the wrongdoer to swear they didn't do it. Then it's a double sin on us because we gave into hatred by trying to force the issue because we were offended that we were done wrong. And then we cause another person to sin by not being long suffering and letting it go. If we let go in love, Allah dwells in long suffering. So that opens up for him to work on that person's heart to think about what they did and possibly repent. Continue, please. And though he deny it, and yet have a sense of shame when reproved, give over reproving him. For he who denieth may repent so as not again to wrong thee. Yea, he may also honor thee and fear and be at peace with thee. See how long suffering and love can turn a relationship around by keeping silence with good intent? If we keep silence after they deny it with the intent that Allah Hayyam take the matter into his hands for the good of all parties involved, peace can bud forth. Also, Allah Hayyam will show where the person truly is by how they operate after the issue. So keeping silence after peacefully bringing up the concern of wrongdoing is helpful in every way. Continue, please. And if he be shameless and persist in his wrongdoing, even so, forgive him from the heart and lead to Allah Hayyam the avenging. So you have the different scenarios. Come peaceably and endeavoring for peace from the heart to speak about a wrongdoing. And then you have scenario one, if the person confesses and repents, forgive them. Scenario two, if the person denies it, keep silence in a pure heart, not holding bitterness about it or offense that they didn't admit to it and forgive them while casting it up to Allah Hayyam and pray for the person to come to repentance. Then scenario three, if the person changes their behavior towards you, Allah Hayyam is working on them, so continue in long suffering. Then scenario four, if they continue in doing wrong unto you, Allah Hayyam has shown you where they are at so you can understand and continue in long suffering, praying for them to come to repentance. Or if they won't change, multiply compassion as Allah Hayyam does when he sees a person is headed for an evil end. Hermas helps understand how letting go of grudges helps heal not only us, but the folks we grudge against too. Hermas Vision 2, Chapter 3, 
verse 1, please. But do thou, Hermas, no longer bear a grudge against thy children, neither suffer thy sister to have her way, so that they may be purified from their former sins. For they shall be chastened with the righteous chastisement, unless thou bear a grudge against them thyself. The bearing of a grudge worketh death. Yes, it does. It's anger that gives rise to this demon of bearing a grudge. Because anger makes us bitter and unable to attain unto holiness. Can you read Hermas Mandate 5, chapter 2, verse 4 through 6 and verse 8, please? Hermas Mandate 5, chapter 2, verse 4. But anger temper is in the first place foolish, fickle, and senseless. Then from foolishness, it engendered bitterness. And from bitterness, wrath. And from wrath, anger. And from anger, spite. Then spite, being composed of all these evil elements, becometh a great sin and incurable. But when all these spirits dwell in one vessel, where the Holy Spirit also dwelleth, that vessel cannot contain them, but overfloweth. The delicate spirit, therefore, as not being accustomed to dwell with an evil spirit, nor with harshness, departeth from a man of that kind, and seeketh to dwell with gentleness and tranquility. I'm jumping to verse 8. Refrain, therefore, from angry temper, the most evil of evil spirits, but clothe thyself in long suffering, and resist angry temper and bitterness, and thou shalt be round in company with the holiness which is beloved of the Lord. Letting go of bitterness <laughs> over offenses committed, whether we did it to ourselves or others offended us, is a godless work and essential to enter the kingdom as infants. Can you read Hermas, parable 9, chapter 31, verse 3 and verse 4, please? Blessed I pronounce you all to be, I, the angel of repentance, whoever of you are guileless as infants, because your part is good and honorable in the sight of Allah I am. Moreover, I bid all of you, whoever have received the seal, keep guilelessness and bear no grudge, and continue not in your wickedness, nor in the memory of the offenses of bitterness, but become of one spirit and heal these evil clefts and take them away from among you that the owner of the flocks may rejoice concerning them. Forgiving ourselves, others, and not being bitter over offenses to ourselves or others is the chief thing for us to be converted and become children again. Can you read Matthew chapter 18, verse three, please? And said, Verily I say unto you, except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. When an offense is done to a child, they forgive and forget very quickly, not holding on to the offense because their intention is peace, love, and harmony. With that being their desire, it's easier for a child to be right back friends playing with those that may have offended them. Yache, the owner of the flock, teaches how important forgiveness is. Can you read Matthew chapter 18, verse 23 to 35, please? And you can Therefore, go into this oh, if you like. Sorry. Okay. I got you. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him 10,000 talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and children, and all that he had, and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him, and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. 
and he had laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother that trespasses. I think that's, he spoke that pretty straightforward. Copper? Yeah? He said if I had something, I got something. I did. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> the moral of the story is, is that it's easier for a person who struggles with forgiveness to be forgiven than to forgive themselves. A person who struggles with forgiveness wants to be forgiven very quickly. They don't want you to hold anything over them. But when it comes to them actually forgiving, they have a hard time and they won't let it go. So this is something that you actually have to pay attention to is that if you do wrong to somebody, are you quick in wanting them to forgive you? And then when somebody does wrong to you, then you're holding it over them for a period of time. You have to understand how that spirit is playing against you and how it's keeping you from actually moving forward because you holding that over somebody that's done wrong to you, it's not hurting them, it's hurting you. And when they actually forgive you quickly as you desire, which is actually right, it's actually helping them and it's not helping you. Because you just want to be forgiven because you don't like the feeling of somebody being upset against you or holding something against you. But yet you like the feeling of holding it against someone else. That's the cherishing of hatred. That's nourishing right. hatred. That's having that pleasure in that evil spirit. You got to overcome the pride. Right. Because when someone's in debt to us, that's our opportunity to either be as Allah I am and have compassion and be lowly to forgive them or to lift ourselves up and to look down on them and hold it over them. Right. In everything, we have opportunity to choose the light or the dark. All right. It's always a choice. So are you finished, Zach? That was very good. I am. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Knowing that, it helps understand the apostles' admonitions even more. Ephesians 4 and 32. In Colossians 3, verse 12 and 13, please. All right. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as Allah am, for Christ's sake have forgiven you. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12 and 13. Put on, therefore, as the elect of Allah am, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Amen. Paul exhorted on the power of these fruits over the spirits of the carnal mind. Can you read Acts of Peter? We're jumping in chapter two here, please. 
Then Paul called for silence and said, men and brethren, which now have begun to believe on Christ. If ye continue not in your former works of the traditions of your fathers and keep yourself from all guile and wrath and fierceness and adultery and defilement and from pride and from envy and contempt and enmity, Yahche, the living Allah will forgive you that ye did in ignorance. Wherefore, ye servant of Allah, arm yourself every one in your inner man with peace, patience, gentleness of the brethren, hospitality, mercy, abstinence, chastity, kindness, justice. Then shall ye have for your guide everlasting, the first begotten of all creation, and shall have strength and peace with our Lord. As the servants of the Lord, who know we need his guidance to overcome the carnal perception, and actions we are struggling with, we have insight now as to the characteristics we need to have in our heart to be guided. Can you read that portion again, please? Wherefore, ye servants of Allah, arm yourselves, every one in your inner man with peace, patience, gentleness of the brethren, hospitality, mercy, abstinence, chastity, kindness, justice, then shall ye have for your guide everlastingly the first begotten of all creation and shall have strength and peace with our Lord. That's guidance everlastingly. It's not going to go away if we have those spirits in our inner man to keep us. The spirits of Belier can't have dominion over us when we have the fear of the Lord and love. Can you read Testament of Benjamin, chapter 3, verse 3, please? Fear ye the Lord, and love your neighbor. And even though the spirit of Belier claim you to afflict you with every evil, yet shall they not have dominion over you, even as they had not over Joseph, my brother. You know this. What was it about Joseph as to why they couldn't have dominion over him? Joseph had the spirit of Allah strengthen him to have compassion and pity for those who wronged him and loved them nonetheless. Can you read Testament of Simeon, chapter 4, verse 4, please? Now Joseph was a good man and had the spirit of Allah within him. Being compassionate and pitiful, he bore no malice against me, but loved me even as the rest of his brethren. By his compassion and pity, he couldn't be ruled by the spirits of Belier. That gives us insight as to how powerful compassion, pity, and not bear malice to be offended or bear grudge against anyone. And to love them as our brother or sister, despite of whatever wrong they may have done. That's very powerful to our Allah and the power of forgiveness delivers us and those we forgive from the advantage Satan has in bitterness and holding a grudge for a wrong done. And the sorrow, guilty conscience, and unforgiveness for oneself in regards to doing the wrong and possibly for the person who did the wrong. The Church of Corinth is a good example to understand this. A man committed fornication with his father's wife and was put out of the church. But he repented and was received again with joy. So we can see how the power of forgiveness helps. Can you read 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3 through 11, please? 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3. And I wrote the same unto you. Least when I come, I should have sorrow from them of whom I ought to rejoice, having confidence in you all, that my joy is the joy of you all. Second Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6. Sufficient to such a man is this punishment, which was inflicted of many. For everyone to know that punishment he had, he was put out of the church. Because the people withstood the evil 
out of love for him because we wanted to see him change. And that was sufficient punishment. Continue, please. So that contrary wise, you are ready to forgive him and comfort him. At least perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. So he came to repentance. And then we get shown what we ought to do when he repents. Continue, please. Wherefore I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward him. For to this end also did I write, that I might know the proof of you, whether you be obedient in all things. So to confirm my love towards a brother in the church setting, when they come to repentance, we forgive and comfort them, lest they should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. We learned earlier about whether a person repents or not, we forgive them, right? Now, in church setting, yes, we forgive them, but we can't have them in the midst of us because they have to really come to repentance when it comes to the church setting. So for understanding of the different scenarios in the church, when somebody's doing something like committing fornication, it's not something that we just let roll over and continue on like nothing's happening. We have to help that person by bringing it to their attention. And if they don't come to repentance, we have to separate from them in hopes that they come to true repentance after Allah Hayamli sought. Okay. Continue, please. Second Corinthians 2 and 10. To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. But if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgive I it in the person of Christ. So for a wrong done, when one person forgives, we all forgive. All right. We do, we're in this together, we're one body. Nobody in the body endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit can bear grudge toward another for a fault that they committed, whether they repent or not. Okay, continue, please. Lee Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Amen. We're not ignorant of how he works in bearing right. a grudge, sorrow, and hatred. Right. And being bitter. We see Satan advantage is to keep us in grief over our faults and unforgiving to those who committed faults, bearing grudges against them for their wrongdoing. Rather, when we see a person who committed a fault is overtaken by sorrow from their mistakes, we have guidance on what to do. Can you read Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, please? Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such and one in the spirit of meekness. Consider in thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Look at that. The temptation from Satan is to bear the grudge and not to forgive them or comfort right. them to come out of their sorrow. That's the hardness of heart. So you see how in the midst of it all, they're being tried by Satan and we're also being tried in how we react as well. But now we know, be spiritual and restore them in the spirit of meekness and be of low estate thinking lowly of ourselves lest we also be tempted all right, all right continue please bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of christ amen lord willing this has been edifying and we now have understanding of how to fulfill the law of christ by being merciful as our father is merciful and being perfect as our father is perfect Amen. All right. We are your brethren here at Hebrew Readers Church. If you have any questions, comments, feel free to write it in the comments section or send us an email at hebrewreaders at gmail.com. And for the edification, you can visit the website at hebrewreaders.com. We hope this series has been really helpful and you all continue in this fight.
we know who our adversary is. We have great understanding of his, his tactics to deceive us. And we praise the Lord Yache for the insight. And may he continue to bless us, showing us our faults so that we can grow unto him. Brother Zachwa. All right. We thank you all. We thank you all for continually supporting the church. And we hope that you guys are growing each and every day. Um, please, even if you don't need anything, it's always good to hear from you guys. Please send us an email just so we can hear from you guys to see how you guys are doing. Um, we love you all and may peace and blessing be unto you. And may Yacha keep us all. Amen. Shout out to Chalam. Shout out to Chalam, everybody. Thank you.